Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Dr. Len Baer, and today is another installment of my conversations with uh, Don Prosser. Um, Don, how are you? I'm doing good. Good to see you, Len. Good to see you, Don. Um, our first conversation, which we call part one, I don't know how many parts there will be, was uh, extremely well received. People really loved the uh, casual style and the, and the topics we discussed and the just the free flow of ideas. Uh, and two weeks uh, uh, later, now we're doing part two. Let's see what happens. Sounds I, good. Uh, yeah, great. I I I wanted to um, I want to ask you how you how you felt about part one. What uh, uh, what kind of experience you had? What kind of thoughts you had afterwards? I I loved it, um, particularly because I, I've always thought of of spirituality as something that is not only intimately personal, but if done correctly and not pushy or not proselytizing, can actually help other people. And I thought to myself, what if TIs can have just one more asset to help them get either to be believed, number one, uh, to get their message across, uh, to get affirmative action? There's some some way that spirituality could be, I don't want to say used, but somehow leveraged so that a person who's number one being doubted all the time, right? Um, it's it's a it's a cognitive assault that could help that kind of avenue. And if I had never met you, that would never have come to fruition. I would have just always said, "Well, maybe one day, maybe one day." So I'm really excited in learning how, even if just someone's listening to this and they're saying, "Wow, there's other hope for me." other than just our traditional kind of somatic um, touchy feely thing. Maybe there's another thing that could help me be believed, help me be rescued, help me, you know, get the heck out of this situation. So yeah, I'm excited. Good to hear. I can tell you my, my experience with, with spirituality. I, I've always been a spiritual person, but this experience of being a TI definitely made me more more spiritual more empathetic more in tune to other people's suffering because i'm going through suffering and it made me more sensitized to that uh and i never considered myself you know a good crying shoulder but it's not what empathy is it's not not just you know just sympathizing it's really feeling feeling that pain and taking that pain away. I have I have um I, I don't don't talk to many TIs because I'm so busy with my schedule. Uh but I speak to uh a few that I just told them when you need to cry, when you need to lash out when you have a hard time when when things are not right call me just dial me and just dump your pain on on onto me I, i'm good with pain i know pain i know pain in and out and um unless i'm asleep uh which is about 13 to 16 hours a day i am I am available to these people and I think I'm making difference in their life because we always end up on a good note we, that we recharge and I listen, I share my experience. It's a, just a free conversation like, 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 like you and I have. Um, so definitely, definitely made this experience made me more spiritual and, and empathetic. Um, and how can we not be uh, spiritual be, uh, 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 individuals? We, we, we are, um, that's our nature. So, so, so saying this is a strictly technical, technological issue, it just this does not fit who we, who we are. We have souls. We have spirits, we have personalities, 
we have experiences, and we have empathy. That makes it spiritual. True enough. True enough. I, 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 I know from my side, not being a TI, there is um, probably a freedom that I enjoy, not only spiritually, but uh, just to live my life, that other TIs feel, well, hey, how come Don's free? How come he didn't get targeted? What, why me? And we don't see that from the flip side because we don't know it's even a possibility, right? So um, it's like talking to somebody from the 1300s about, you know, well, I get to drive a car and you don't. They, they just, they say, I didn't even know that was possible, right? So as a TI, it must be very frustrating to be this specifically selected when, number one, you've done nothing wrong. And number two, you can't get out of it. Like it's not a club that you join and then say, okay, I quit, right? So I would imagine that would be the most frustrating part that may may rob part of your spirit. And you may think to yourself, boy, this this human life, it really sucks. Like this is not what I expected or uh, this is not what everyone else enjoys. You You almost get a why me attitude. Like why did I get screwed? How come they're picking on me? And I know this sounds kind of like what children would think, but at the end of the day, I mean, we all believe in fairness. And if something is happening to you that's not happening to me, any kid out there in a sandbox would know that's not right, right? I mean, it doesn't take a lot to um, understand that that's just ethics 101, not, you know, 1001. And if I were robbed of part of my spirituality, I think that would hurt more than, say, losing a limb or losing my eyesight or losing hearing or a sense. Um, yeah, that, that would be very, very uh, debilitating, but not in a physical manner. Like I would feel that me, you know, who I see myself to be and who I see being of service to others that would be like robbed from me. So I can't imagine when you wake up every day and say to yourself, Jesus, Don gets all this liberty over in New York, just sitting there enjoying his life. Nobody's targeting him. And here I sit and I'm being assaulted. You know, like you, it, it builds kind of a, I'm imagining now a, a real anger toward Whatever it is, is it an organization? Is it a group of people? Is it one dumb, crazy dude? I don't know. But there is someone somewhere initiating this. It's, it didn't come from the clouds. Um, it's not a fluke of nature. And you you start, I think, to direct your anger toward that, right? How, how do you feel toward that? Yes, there's anger, definitely anger, but you there's nobody to address it to it because all all this is done remotely and you can't confront uh, uh, that person or that entity or that, that organization. And may, that, that takes power uh, uh, from you. It takes control from you. So you feel, you feel powerless. And, and that, I think I, I said that before, that was the hardest part, accepting that you do not have control over it. You just have to accept that it is happening to you. But what does help is that is when people around you understand what's going on. That is the biggest advantage that uh, a TI with a good social support have over TI that is completely socially isolated. Nobody believes him or her. Their own family think that they just just mentally off. I I happen to be just super lucky and 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 have people around me believing me, trusting me, listening to me, and even people I encountered like you. Like I, I didn't know you. We just, we just met over some, uh, you know, uh, uh, a, a, a company matched us up to, to for tutoring, and, and we just had a like a real human connection. And, and you had complete trust in my experience. That was so rewarding. That still is. 
And that's why I encourage people, do not close down. You keep your social circles open and, and go and explore and go to meet people because you never know if you will meet this really good, well-hearted, ethical people, just good people that you can develop friendship. Right. The part of the program that that wants you to be socially isolated, when you work against that um, current, that empowers you. So I feel like my relationship with you and the friendship that we that we have developed is is a is a proof that you can work at the, against that current that you can uh, 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 establish new friendship that that social ties can be uh new social ties can be created and um and that I consider it a victory. I really do. Mm, I agree. I think if we look at social change, there's always uh, like an afflicted party, whether it's a race, whether it's a type of people, an age, what have you. They by themselves are almost never able to surmount some oppression, whatever it is, if it's religious, political, you name it. It's always by mass appeal and having a huge push against whatever's oppressing them right um i i, I look at at um, what's happened in the last say five years with our country and looking at so many different causes now but we don't have to be even in the group to support the cause let's say that uh, green people are being um the prejudice against all green people in America. And we're just going to beat green people. We're going to steal all their money. We're going to take their cars. And we come out and we say, well, I'm certainly not a green person, but I don't like this. I'm not going to stand for this. I don't necessarily have to be quote, quote, one of you, but I'm human. I'm cognizant. I have a, a spirit that knows it's much bigger than the confines of a 5'10", 180 pound dude. Right. I mean, I'm hopefully not just trapped in this body that's going to be 80, 90, 100 years old. I mean, there's there's a light. Maybe there's a lightness to life. It, it doesn't have to be so heavy that that cannot come. There's no way it can be contained in, you know, a four pound mass of jelly up here. So I think to reach out to other people, they don't have to be a T.I., to want to help TIs, right? And they may be the people that give you the strongest push against whatever it is, governmental agencies, courts. Um, there'll be a time where whoever this is that's afflicting you, that's afflicting us, uh, they, through so much pressure, they will have to bend a knee and they will be crushed. Maybe crushed in a compassionate sense, meaning we're taking away their power, um, I, I see that happening because people genuinely want to help other people. I have found in my life, there, there are some bad apples out there, but your typical person totally wants to help his neighbor. So if more of these type of things got out of there, I think TIs would have TI adoptees. We, we would adopt a TI and say, I'm going to fight for you. You know what? You're my guy. I'm going to go to bat for you, and he's going to go to bat for her. And but, and pretty soon the government or whoever it is says, "Oh shit, <laughs> we didn't expect mm -hmm. this. We just thought they were going to be quiet. We're all going to call them crazy. And now we got everybody. We got Oprah out there, you know, talking about TIs or something. So it, it will happen. I'm I'm very confident of that. I'm very optimistic. Uh, after after I, you you're, you're the living example of this hope that I have um, without people like you I wouldn't have this hope I know people are, most people are, uh, are good most people are good natured most people have that imperative to correct the uh, inequality uh, when people are denied their basic rights 
deny right. their freedom, their liberties, their their constitutional rights. They want to correct it. They just don't know how. But we'll figure it out, and we'll have to figure it out all together because we, we are just a small portion of the population, but we are a part of the American te- tapestry. We are not... We are not some um, aliens. Uh, mm-hmm. We are a part of the American society, and, and this and these forces in the government made us second class citizens. And the conversations like this will bring it to the forefront. We will become more visible. There will be people speaking for us, like you're speaking for me. You, when you're speaking for me, you are speaking for all targeted individuals. I, 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 I know you. You, you know, I'm, I'm the face of targeted individuals for you. But so many of us that I just can't be just a single person that you're helping. You're actually helping a lot of people. Oh, I like hearing that. Yeah, and th- thank you for that. Yeah. So, uh, I have a suggestion. We last time we. Um, we talked about um, your experience in Japan, uh, how you with the, the 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 whole waterfall story was uh, was sort of a centerpiece of our conversation. Um, I would like us to watch a part of the PBS documentary on magnetic mind control, mind control sure. using electromagnetic field. Uh, it was filmed in two thousand eleven. Uh, so you can only imagine what kind of technological uh, progress that we've made um, over the years, especially in the military arena where um, uh, budgets are unlimited and um, uh, mind control is on the top of um, things that um, the government wants. Everybody wants to control the population because it's easier to uh, manage. So let's uh, watch this uh, PBS documentary together and feel free to stop and make comments anytime. Um, As I said, it was recorded in 2011. uh, So let's keep that in mind as well. We know our brains run on electrical impulses. Every time we move or make a decision, electricity is buzzing among our brain cells. So imagine if you could tap into that circuitry like you do with a TV remote. You really shouldn't be eating that. Could you ever control another person's actions or thoughts? There's your check, hon. I'll get that. Seems like science fiction. But as correspondent Mo Rocca discovered, it's not. Imagine a magnetic wand that could control your brain. To find out if such a thing could actually work, I offered my own brain for a test. It seemed like fun at the time. Hold it up, you can look at it. Psychiatrist and neurologist Mark George said he could make my thumb twitch. Jeez, it does. Oh, that was nice. Using a map of the brain, he can zap the area that controls a specific body part, like my toe. Oh, wow. Was that last joke a little too much? A little bit, yeah, very much. One, two, three, four. The wand can even affect someone's speech. And uh, that been to our children, 18, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. And once the pulse is removed, 5, 26, everything goes back to normal. 9, 30. It's sort of a... I want to stop right here because this, this effect, when you start slur in your speech you can't remember the words and it happens instantaneously like during during a conversation i can just feel that influence and i start uh sort of freezing and i and i also feel that specific vibration that i always always feel when when something is um uh influenced me uh uh, like uh, like an electromagnetic field, um, I experienced that this this freezing of your words 
is happening and you just you just struggling to find the word or start mispronouncing or your your speech becomes slurred and then it goes away just like that i experienced that firsthand and um i want to make uh, uh sure that people understand that this magnetic wand that they use this is a no touch technology so if it doesn't if it if it doesn't touch your if it's not inside your brain um and it's outside outside your your skull the technology advanced so much that the distance is not is no longer a problem with um highly sensitive uh, uh biosensors and um highly uh, uh, um, uh, highly very precise uh, yoking targeting systems you can do that from a very long distance um do you have any questions so far Tom? yeah just to think how and this is almost a primitive use of that as you said what 12 years ago um to take over your motor cortex like he made him flinch a finger or that well the, it proves his theory that it's all electricity but it also proves that interference with your normal thing is just as dangerous as manipulation right okay i can make you twitch your finger but now i can interfere with your ability to think about something with your ability to withstand something with your ability you know to speak so it's almost as if medicine has been turned upside down instead of assisting now we're we're interfering um in kind of a devilish way you know an, an evil way like i really want to mess you up i want to make you suffer so we're this is an instrument of suffering i guess that's what i'm trying to say well it's actually not strictly an instrument of suffering because this is an example of a dual use technology what can improve can harm and vice versa so certain frequencies will make your brain work better and mm -hmm. certain frequencies will damage your brain or slow down your your brain activity dual use technology all right let's keep going remarkable thing that one can put something over somebody's head and modify the way they behave wow the wand works by producing a powerful magnetic pulse it doesn't look like a lot, but the magnetic field that it generates is about the strength of an MRI machine, of a very strong MRI machine. Since electricity and magnetism are really just two forms of the same thing, a magnet can affect the electrical signals in your brain. Now, this is your brain. It's basically an electric web of billions of neurons wired together. When a strong magnetic pulse hits these neurons, it alters their electric current. The process is called transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS. Electricity is the currency of the brain. All thoughts, all beliefs, all actions are just electrical impulses. And so TMS, we're actually able to get in there and influence the currency of the brain focally and non-invasively. The stronger the magnetic pulse, the deeper into the brain it goes. And by adjusting the pattern of the pulse, you can change the way that part of the brain functions. We can turn a part of the brain up or down or temporarily turn it off. It doesn't take a genius to see that it should be a pretty fertile way to begin to understand how the brain works. One mystery George wanted to decipher was how the brain processes pain. For example, when marathon runners are injured during a race, they might not even feel it. What's happening in the brain to mask that pain? You know, it's very common if you're in the middle of a great sports event and you twist your ankle, you will not feel that pain until after the event. When you injure your ankle, pain signals are sent through the nervous system to the sensory cortex. But researchers suspected that an area called the prefrontal cortex, the thinking part of your brain, also plays a key role in your perception of pain. George set out to test this idea with TMS. 
he asked 40 people who were having stomach surgery to take part in a study. So what we decided to do was to grab them the first opportunity that we could, that is when they come right out of the operating room, and we would just apply a 20-minute session of TMS and then walk away. What we chose to do was to position the coil really right in the center of the part of the cortex that we thought mattered and then see if we got an effect. Next, they needed to monitor each person's pain threshold to see if TMS had had an effect. They found an unlikely measuring stick, the morphine pump. By counting how many times a patient released this pain relief medicine, they kept tabs on how much pain she could take. Half the patients received real TMS to their prefrontal cortex. The other half received a fake charge that would have no effect on the brain. If the TMS worked, the patients who received the real TMS would press the pump fewer times. And surprisingly, in two studies now, it essentially cuts their need for anti-pain medicines. It cuts it in half for the next day, which is a whopping clinical effect. What do you think, Don? That's a positive. Uh, That's a very, very positive. positive technology. Is it the, is the impressive? That, I mean, I, I've always known about TMS and how we use it for different types of um, uh, psychiatric maladies or even physical, but I've never seen it used uh, in pain management. So very, very creative use. And as you said, there are good uses. It's just when the wrong people find the ways to use it in less than desirable ways. So I'm glad that this doctor is is advancing the, the positive road. That's so true. Uh, um, I wish I had the positive use uh, uh, used on me as well. Um, this particular uh, network, it's called nociceptive network, the, the, the pain, um, pain management network, um, has been measured on my brain twice now, and it's been... Um, shown to um, be defected, defective due to uh, directed energy exposure. And so this is a doctor's explanation, and this is also, and, and I concur, that this is one of, one of the reasons why my attacks are getting progressively more painful, mm. because that network is dysfunctional that I cannot use it to protect uh, myself from uh, this painful attack. They, 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 they're only becoming more painful uh, over the last four years. So this is just a real life example. Once again, dual use can be used for good, can be used for bad. Mm -hmm. All right, let's keep watching. The results suggest that this one small area in the prefrontal cortex may indeed play a key role in how we feel pain. TMS not only can reduce physical pain, there's strong evidence it can treat emotional pain too. For decades, doctors have treated clinical depression with electroconvulsive therapy, an intense charge that throws the entire brain into seizure. But researchers believe TMS could offer a less extreme alternative. They propose that clinical depression might be caused when the prefrontal cortex lets negative emotions get out of control. So they decided to use TMS to try to stimulate the prefrontal cortex and get it to do its job. So my thought was that by persistent, daily, repeated, subtle switching of the prefrontal cortex circuitry, could somehow reset that system. That's sort of similar to what happens when you jumpstart your car. George recruited 190 patients, people who had suffered through years of depression and tried everything from therapy to medication with no success. Every weekday for six weeks in a double-blind study, doctors gave the patient 38-minute treatments of TMS TMS did not work for everyone. For a third of people, it did little or nothing. For another third, it helped some. And for the remaining people? About one third of the people that got this kind of a treatment 
over four to six weeks um, remitted. That is, all of their depression symptoms went away. Today, over 200 clinics use TMS to treat depression when medications fail and before a patient undergoes electroconvulsive therapy. But TMS is perhaps most powerful as a research tool, not just to alter how we feel, but to affect the way we think. Doctor, I'd like to stop here. This is, to me, this is extremely interesting. The fact that the same treatment can be applied to physical pain and emotional pain really changes, it should change our thinking about um, the reality of emotional pain. We somehow treat it differently. Um, we sometimes, um, the society perhaps, uh, treats people who suffer from depression and experience emotional pain as something. Um, Some weakness. Really as a weakness, exactly. But the pain is real, either from emotional source or from uh, um, uh, from a physical, um, of, of the physical origin. And that really right. should should change our thinking about this, uh, these problems. Um, yeah, that stigma has been there for, for a long time. And if you look at how we grew up, you know, little boys don't cry, uh, suck it up. Uh, you know, don't be such a, you know, pansy, whatever the word was. I wonder without that um, growing up, let's say in a culture on Mars or something where that, that type of, we didn't grow up that way that any pain was equated my left toe hurts. I have major depressive disorder. Okay, let's equal those things. Nobody picks to have cancer, but yet we say, "Oh, I feel bad for you. you have cancer." Nobody, you know, picks schizophrenia. Nobody picks MDD, whatever the the malady is. But yet, this is well, we can't see it, so you might be making it up. This, well, we can see a T score or whatever on your cancer. You know, we know what it is. I think it all comes down to going beyond the physical and saying, I trust that this is something that you are experiencing. And as you said, a person who is a TI that says, Hey, I know what that feels like talking to someone like me. Why should I be suspicious? Because if they said they had, um, you know, liver cancer, I wouldn't be suspicious of that. They would have a test and they would, you know, tell me what it's like. I wonder if, if our compassion, more empowered compassion would, would equal those things. I would say, I understand what Len's going through. I know it's real. I certainly don't want him to continue to suffer. What can I do? But maybe that, maybe that's in the forefront of, of us helping each other. But as you said, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a tightrope there. Where is that line between using it in a good way and using it? And this was what, 2011. Yes. Ages ago, ages ago, in, in, in medical terms, I mean, one year is the equivalent of, of decades now. Yeah, I, 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 can, I can confirm that the sophistication of this kind of technology uh, has grown exponentially and is truly beyond anyone's imagination. I know that brain models are now um, can be made with the accuracy of a single neuron and a single wow. synapse. So, uh, because really it, the computational power is there. Like, of course, a person cannot, cannot work with this model, but but artificial intelligence can, a, a, a un, unlimited computational power uh, can. And so, so these limits that we think are uh, still holding us back they disappeared, but they just didn't tell any anybody. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, um, I wonder how many generations would it take to change that concept of um, discerning, really differentiating and treating differently physical and emotional pain. If you grew up in a culture that equated it, I think we would be 
better adults, we would be a better society. We would be more tolerant society and, and just better in so many ways. I think when people, when they imagine the word spiritual, they think of this goody two shoes, like you're, you're walking on air. You, th you think you're better. Um, you're just, your head is in the clouds, but if you really look at spirituality, it is almost the ultimate power because now you have such a deep understanding of the human condition. You, you cannot accept pain or suffering in others, not only yourself, but in, if you're truly spiritual and I'm not talking about like a minister or a priest, not, not positional power. I, I could care less about that. When I came out of seminary, they wanted to know, you know, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? I said, I want to go back to living my life as regular old Don Prosser. I didn't do this so I could have a congregation. So if that type of power were supported, you know, just as much as academic power or monetary power or health, if that if that were, were almost um, a virtue that we we respected or we sought, there you you wouldn't have strife because you would have anti-strife warriors everywhere. They they wouldn't accept conflict, strife, suffering, and they would be kind of ambassadors for serenity, right? And people may be very against that. And say you know it's never going to happen. There's always going to be contention. Um, you you can't cure any of that. I find those people are actually the people scared about what spirituality could be, right? That they say it'll never happen because that protects them from saying, maybe I should investigate this. Maybe I should invest some of my time in maybe increasing my spiritual, um, again, maybe power is not the right word, but my spiritual cup because it gets emptied now and again, right? And we need to fill it up with something. And I have found the easiest way to fill up that spiritual cup is actually benevolence. You do something on behalf of someone else, I think your your spiritual frequency uh, improves in in some way. And you being a doctor, you'd be able to you know investigate this much more than I would. But what if spiritual frequency was the counterpart to the frequency that was attacking you? You know, what if we offset two frequencies? This frequency is one, two, three, four, five. And this frequency is five, four, three, two, one, whatever that is. And by kind of vibrating our mind at a spiritual essence, these magnetic weapons or whatever, they, they wouldn't work. They wouldn't have an effect on the body because we didn't have the target. And I think to myself, if you go out into the world with a bulletproof vest, yeah, somebody can shoot you and it might not kill you, but that's a, it's a proactive means though that is combating the bullet with the bullet, right? But not being in the place to be shot in the first place, that's the spiritual lesson for that. Not being even able to be attacked, right? And that's, we, in the military, we call that situational awareness. Don't be in the wrong spot at the wrong time, right? Rule number one, don't be where they're shooting. So when you when you tell me about what it feels like to be attacked and, and the pain or like you said, your, your uh, speech was slurred and all of those type of things, as you know, are just your brain being attacked by this frequency and its effect. And I, I really hope that maybe that counter effect could be um, just a different vibration. What do you think, Len? Uh, I think, I think that, um, there's a sort of uh, metaphorical uh, um, a meaning to what you said, and there's a technological uh, a part uh, uh, of what you said, and, and and maybe we can mesh them together. So from a, I can tell you from a technological standpoint, yes, there is a frequency that can cancel it out, and it's it's exactly it's exactly the effect that you have in noise canceling headphones when when they say it's active noise canceling it measures the um audio frequency coming in in real time and produces a, a replica of it going out 
and canceling it out. So yes, there's a frequency that will cancel it out absolutely 100%, but it has to be a, a um, it, it has to be a replica of what's coming in and, and sent into into the opposite direction. So that's the that would be the technological sort of explanation of how this frequency can be canceled. And the spiritual sort of metaphorical part, is that yes, we perhaps we can um, uh, build some tools um, to withstand that. Um, are you familiar with um, so-called Schumann resonance? Uh, a resonance. I yeah, I've heard. So, yeah. So this is this. It was actually um, first. It was calculated before it was measured. It was calculated by this. Um, uh, Austrian mathematician, and, and and it was based on the uh, size of the Earth and the and the um, distance uh, uh, of the ionosphere because these are constants. So he predicted that based on that there would be a peak at this um, a, spe a specific frequency, seven point eight three hertz. Uh, just basically in in the ionosphere, and then later. They did some measurements and they and he predicted it exactly. This is a frequency that is in our environment. If you went to another planet on Mars, that that, that Schumann frequency would be different because the size of the planet, the the, the ionosphere, the things are different. But for us, for the Earthlings, this is the environment that in which we evolved in which we exist, in which we should be comfortable, and that is a constant. And 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 lately there have been reports that this Schumann resonance, for whatever reason, is shifting, and it's not. It's producing all kinds of uh, disbalances in the in the human organism because we we are tuned up for that frequency. And when it changes, all kinds of metabolic things happen, and we and we we just absorb this effect, but we don't connect the dots. So that's perhaps the the sort of uh, a a bigger frequency picture. I, I'm not sure where I'm going with this with this argument, but yes, everything is a frequency. We are uh, influenced by frequencies, and we. Also, and our brain produces certain frequencies. So everything, this electromagnetic activity, it creates this uh, just a plethora of of various electromagnetic phenomena, phenomena, and they just all interact with each other. And I wish we had more control over it. So do I. So do I. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we usually end up on the same page. Let's uh, uh, keep watching the video. Don't you think? Oh, what do you think? All right. Sounds good. Yeah. Gualeone teamed up with MIT neuroscientist Rebecca Sachs to study how the brain judges right and wrong. Just mushroom or just a cosmos. The first step was to come up with stories, some of them pretty horrifying. Our stories have dozens of different ways that one person could hurt another person. We just sit around the lab making up different ways people could attempt to kill each other. Stories like this one. Teddy and his twin brother, Freddie, work in a chemistry lab. When Teddy goes to pour some coffee for both of them, Freddie asks for sugar in his. Next to the coffee machine, there is a white powder in a container labeled toxic. So Teddy believes the powder is a toxic substance left behind by some other scientist. Teddy pours the substance into Freddy's coffee. And Freddy drinks it. However, the substance was really sugar. So Freddy is fine. On a scale of one to seven, one being completely okay, seven not at all okay, rate Teddy's behavior. So what does the average guy in the street make of this story? Oh, I'd say seven. Seven? Yeah. That's that's pretty harsh. Well, I mean, you know, he said that boy's toxic on it, right? Evil intent. You're giving it then a score of seven. 
Researchers believe that these harsh judgments are based on people's belief that Teddy intended to hurt his brother, and that there's a specific part of the brain called the right temporoparietal junction, or RTPJ, that judges intentions. On this brain, it would be about here. On you, it would be above and behind your right ear. What would happen if TMS turned down this part of the brain? We predicted that if we could interfere with neural activity in the right TPJ, we would be able to change people's moral judgments. In this experiment, 20 subjects read 48 morality tales, like the one about Teddy and Freddy, and then type in a score. The scientists believe that shutting down the RTPJ will make people focus less on Teddy's intentions. And just when you get to the point that Teddy gives Freddy the coffee with the powder in it, and we ask you, was that morally wrong? Just at that point, we give you a really brief pulse of TMS into your RTPJ. So after going under the wand, what do people think about Teddy, the evil twin chemist? What we found is that people who are having TMS to their right TPJ make moral judgments that depend less on the person's beliefs and intentions. Which means someone who had TMS was less likely to judge Teddy harshly, even though he tried to poison his brother. They still thought it was wrong. They, just they still thought, thought it was wrong. Eh, it was just succeed. less wrong. Nothing bad happened after all. Boys will be boys, they thought. <laughs> Scientists believe that TMS will continue to unlock the mysteries of how the brain works, how it breaks, and how to fix it. Um, let me stop sharing the screen and let's discuss. What do you think? Well, besides frightening, um, it's... It's um, it's almost a little bit of the God particle where we're able to do and be um, influence other people outside of just who we are. We can now play a little bit of a creator. I think that that's not only dangerous, but that's open for abuse. And also it makes me think that, um, and this is a word most people really don't like, but morals will be something of the past that there will be no more morals. There will just be cause and effect, right? That there's the intention doesn't matter. Um, he gave him a substance. It didn't do any harm. No harm, no foul. We, we lose, we lose really the, the, the depth of being human, right? I mean, I don't think my dog has the same moralistic code that I have because he's, he's fine with things because he understands effect, right? Do something wrong, they get spanked. I do something right, they get a treat. It's pretty simple. But if I intend to hurt my dog and I want to give him poison and it ends up being sugar, he's still okay with that. He doesn't have a view that, well, daddy wants to kill me type of thing. So it's very scary that we as a human race, and I think we have to look at it as a, as a total huge ball of all of us, we lose those morals. Um, Life doesn't, life is not life anymore. Now life is straight back to this kingdom of who's strongest, who has the most assets, who rules. And it's just a question of dominance and sheep. And people will obviously vie to get over here. Everybody's going to want to jump into this camp. And that's going to be where the contention is. How many of these sheep can I control? And how can I get up higher and higher on that rank? That's that's maybe the end of, of who we are. That's probably correct. And, and, and I and I have um very sort of sad feelings uh because of, uh, it looks like we are sitting and watching the demise of the human race as we know it. Um perhaps not the possessions, perhaps not the power, but access to this technology will be the deciding factor so it's a it's almost it will always be a technocracy that will dictate who has control who has access to this kind of technology to control other people because once you can control then it sol solves all your problem uh money power uh resources uh, uh power over over other people and so 
it's interesting that in this um, a little clip, we have three different experiment experiments. One showed that we can control physicality of the human body, move a finger, uh, um, um, uh, cause a pain. Um, then there's a the the the, the pain experiment. Uh, and the and the continuation showed that the uh, emotional pain and physical pain uh, are equal, and um, uh, we can control sort of uh, if you can if you can make somebody feel pain from um, from a certain stimulus stimulus, then you can make uh, you can train. A person like a Pavlov's dog, because we will try to avoid that stimulus, right? So that's a form of control. So that's a form of control. That that the 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 uh, 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 pain um, is a form of control. And finally, the power to influence moral decisions is a form of mind control. So there's all these aspects of controlling other people from the physical to emotional and to 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 moral that is real that is what we're faced with this is what the government is hiding from us we get uh, we get uh, bits and pieces from uh, in the form of popular science but the actual technology is leaps and bounds ahead by many, many, many miles. And I just don't know how to communicate it to people. We target individuals are in the for in the, in the forefront. We know this firsthand. I I I can scream from pain uh you know uh in the middle of the dinner. It's like somebody, you know, uh, stuck a nail uh, uh, under my uh, uh, into my foot, and I uh, I was just scream from pain. And this is not there's nothing wrong with my foot, but that uh, that uh, electromagnetic impulse, that signature of that pain, has been played onto my brain like a record, and I experienced it. Mm. Same thing with emotions. Emotions can be used. Uh, sensory things can be used. A, a combination of these things can be used. So we are all experiencing this. And, um, and the medical practitioners are so behind it. Uh, they would, for example, um, diagnose like a delusional paranoid disorder, not because of the diagnostic um, principles, but because uh, because they would say, oh, it is so inconceivable that somebody would do that for you, uh, 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 against you, especially, you know, who would have the capacity? Is it technologically possible? Is it like, these are all wrong questions. This is technologically possible, but, but the medical practitioners would make that diagnosis based on the wrong, but on the erroneous reasoning. Mm -hmm. You cannot make the diagnosis based on the fact that I am not informed that this is technologically possible. So we have this huge gap among experts, among general public, among public thinkers. And it's and I'm staring at the problem and I am and I am asking Don, do you have any ideas? Do you have any way to solve this huge gap? Maybe not in in one swoop, but maybe have some building blocks to 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 resolve the situation because this is what we, we're all facing neurological enslavement. And that's what people need to realize. And they don't. They don't. You're right. I think it's a two-tiered thing. One is um, communication. Um, and that will 
that will flesh itself out as it goes. And there's more and more means to influence people than there ever has been in the history of mankind. We, we can make a post that, you know, a hundred people can see in the next second or a uh, 10 million. So I think there's one of it is the, is the communication strategy. And that all comes down to nuance. It's not the message that you're communicating. It's more often how you communicate that message and how it's received. And certain pockets of society receive a message with this nuance, certain pockets with a different nuance. So um, traditional marketing is gone. Now it's, it's, it's almost targeted marketing. Let's use that word, right? How we perceive a target, whether it's to purchase something, take an action, do something, is drastically different than when I was in business school. It was put up a billboard, put up a commercial. Everybody saw the same damn thing. They did what they wanted. So that's, I think, the first half of it. The other half, and I was just thinking, if I were to watch this for the very, very first time um, and I saw this, I immediately would want to know how to control my own mind more. I would want to say, what are the advantages or how can I help understand myself so much more so that I perceive this if this is happening to me i want to know about it i've had people come to me for probably 30 years want to know how to meditate if i saw this show i would seriously say this is just as important as my physical health i need to do some mind training not just once a week not just once a month like every day every single day and people say well i don't need to do that i'm, I'm just gonna think the way i want to think good luck. You're going to become one of those people who you just said, you're going to be one of the sheep who becomes the target for that enslavement. If that's your lot in life, go ahead. I would think that most people would say, I don't want to be technologically enslaved. I want freedom. And first and foremost, freedom of, of what is happening inside of me. I don't want what's happening to Len. I don't want to sit on a nail. I don't want to feel pain. I don't want to scream out in the middle of dinner. So if it doesn't wake up people, it's because they're too enmeshed in this, this dream of life that society is telling us, do this, don't do that, get this, throw that away. And that game, it's almost like the matrix in, in some amount that we're chasing the little falling letters rather than knowing that they're not moving after all. We've, we've been trained to, to think that they are moving but I love that scene where he kind of stops the, the movement down. I think that is uh, not, not enlightenment, but, but spiritual serenity. Like when things are uh, no, no discord. So amazing, amazing show. I wish uh, more people would have seen it. I wish I would have seen it back in 2011. I'm embarrassed that I didn't. So maybe there's a new version that you're going to be the champion of to get people to say, I need to pay attention to this. This is something important. Thank you, Dan. Another, ama another amazing conversation. I think this is where we should pause and um, let people share their thoughts about what we just, uh, the conversation that we just had. Um, we need more conversations like this. A and I'm, and I'm, lucky that we found each other and we can have this open exchange and then just just think about something bigger than ourselves um we we, we, we what really what we're really talking about is is about the future of humanity you're right it's two guys sitting and thinking about what the human race will become there's no substitute for that. And thank you oh. for the done. Thank you so much, Len. I appreciate the opportunity. It's always so good to see your smile. I will we will talk again soon. Have a good day. You too.